Well, Tom, this, um, these interviews, as I mentioned a little earlier, but now I'm doing it on camera and on, on, on uh, disc, is for basically at present time for the magazine, is to, uh, for all artists with historical importance from all forms of roots music. Uh, eventually, it will go into a book. How many volumes it will be, who knows? But it's, uh, it's going to run for, these interviews will run for several years. And uh, so I introduce you all, ladies and gentlemen, the legend is Tom Paley. This <laughs> yeah. is about legend. That's leg and that's <laughs> a, a, a foot or a toe. <laughs> so, Tom, where was you born and when was you born? Well, I was born in a hospital in New York, mm -hmm. New York City, uh, on the 19th of March, 1928. Which is quite a while ago. I don't even remember the the birth. You don't. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, I'm, well, there's a lot to fit into your memory, Tom, isn't yeah. it? Yeah. yeah. Your parents were involved politically, weren't they? They were left wing activists. Yeah. yeah. Well, my father was. I don't know how. My mother wasn't that as much active politically, but but she was also on the left wing side. Mm, mm, mm. Yeah. So you grew up with politics and music, did you? Because yeah. your parents were obviously musically inclined. Well, my father didn't play an instrument. I mean, I think he could hack out a tune, you know, with one finger on a piano or something like that. But he was a good singer. And my mother taught piano, uh, not in any school or anything, but just in, you know, in the flat. She occasionally had pupils coming in and she'd give lessons. And at one point, she gave me a few lessons, but I wasn't really interested in piano somehow. I, the, the only instrument I played in my early days was harmonica. And uh, I had a cousin, Richard, who was a good harmonica player, and he got me started on, on the idea of playing harmonica. And so I played it a bit, but I, I never really uh, put a lot of energy into it. Uh, Somehow that waited until I got started on guitar. So when would this be, Tom? When did you first pick up the guitar, do you think? Well, I mean, aside from maybe picking someone else's guitar up and just stumbling <laughs> on it like that. Uh, now, my parents split up at various times and got together again and split up and got together again. At one point, my mother took me and my then sort of almost baby sister, she was, she was two or three years old, I guess, out to California. And uh, I was in high school at the time and uh, went to school in L.A. And then we were there, I think, for only about a year and a half until my parents decided again on getting together, or decided on getting together again. And so we went back to New York. And uh, while, while we were out in Los Angeles, I had heard a fair bit of what's it called country music. Uh, there were some radio stations that had uh, some, well, let's say country music. Uh, some of it was these sort of bands that were built up and were doing a kind of pop music with a country accent. But there were also individual singers. I remember a guy named Texas Jim Robertson, who, uh, or Robinson, no, Robertson, I think. And various others, uh, Montana Slim, I think, who did sort of old cowboy songs that sounded real somehow. They sounded like they dealt with something in real life. And so that interested me. And when we got back to New York, I was uh, in, a, in a crowd that was interested in folk music, well, partly from a political viewpoint, but also it was music that a lot of people listened to. And uh, we had some performers in New York who did this folk music, real traditional stuff. Woody Guthrie was one, 
uh, Lead Belly, Pete Seeger, Josh White. Again, mainly people are politically left. Maybe some, I don't really remember how political Josh White was, but he sure could play. <laughs> anyway, at some point I decided I wanted to start playing, and I went out and got myself a guitar, a cheap guitar. And it, we were living down on the Lower East Side in, in Manhattan at that time, and not very far away from an area in which there were lots of porn shops and not porn, <laughs> P-A-W-N, porn shop, hawk shops. And um, there may have been the others as well. <laughs> but, but anyway, uh, I got myself a cheap guitar and I spent a little time fixing it up and I had something that showed a few chords for playing the guitar. And so I learned to finger a few chords and found that I could strum the thing and uh, uh, you know, accompany myself in a very simple way, on simple songs. And then I went around to this. I was a member in an organization called AYD, American Youth for Democracy, which was a left-wing organization. And uh, a, a particular club that I was a member of uh, also ran square dances and uh, had club meetings in which people would sing. And so after, after I'd gotten a little bit familiar with playing the strumming on the guitar, uh, I ventured to get up and sing a song now and then with a guitar. I also, once I started on the guitar, I got myself a banjo pretty shortly afterwards and learn to do some very elementary things on the banjo. Uh, and I started going more and more often to the square dances and folk, folk music gatherings and began picking up some skill on both the instruments. Uh, I was a long way from uh, being a real expert, but I, I could play a decent background to, to my songs. Uh, not sure what, what else to say. <laughs> that was my what introduction. Have been, Tom? What? About what time are you talking about? Before Which the war, year? During the war or after Which the war? Which year? Well, Mars. let's see. I, I was 17 when I got the guitar, or I think it was maybe some months before I turned 17. So that would be 1945. And uh, then, yeah, but that, that's the period talking about 1944, 45, been, 46. Have you been on your own or with, the, with a band? Like with oh, no, I wasn't part of a band yet. No, uh, was you know, was at the beginning, I was own. just, what? You were doing it on your own? Yeah, but it's come, well, the band well, comes in later. I, I would go to these groups, uh, um, these meetings, either square dancing or, or, or folk song meetings. And so I would be with other people, but I, when I performed, it was generally on my own okay. at, those, at those meetings. There was a big growing folk, slowly growing folk boom happening around then, wasn't there? With yeah. It, uh, yeah, I, I can't give you the details of, of exactly how it was going, but. Yeah, there was getting to be a little more interest in the weavers. Folk. Things like what the weavers? Well, not yet. Oh, uh, that was before, was it? Well, 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 the weavers, the weavers started. I was already playing quite a bit uh, uh, by the time the weavers started, as well as I remember. Uh, it's hard to pinpoint exact times, but as I remember, <clears throat> well, one of the things after a while. Uh, a year or so after I had started, when I could already play reasonably, a Pete Seeger lived in Greenwich Village in New York City. And there used to be occasional gatherings in the cellar of the house, well, or the downstairs, it was, uh, it was a sort of a half flight of stairs down on the street level. Uh, there'd be a gathering. 
other people with guitars or banjos or just wanting to sing a little bit or listen to the music. So there'd be these gatherings of a dozen people. So it's not a big audience kind of thing, but but there'd be a few of us there. We take turns doing a song or in some cases playing a tune. And by that time, I, I could play the instruments well enough to be able to play a tune on the banjo or something. Um, was, that, yeah. was that Pete's apartment or was it the Pete or the Seeger family home? Well, it was, uh, well, Pete and his family, um, Toshi and, I, I, I don't remember who else was actually living there. It's just, uh, the reason I'm asking is because I know the Seegers had a family servant called Elizabeth Cotton, who wrote yeah. Freight Train. Yeah, well... And that's how she was yeah. discovered. Well, but that, but that that was that was down in Washington, do you see? Oh, she, okay. she hadn't been... I don't remember seeing her at Pete Seeger's place in Greenwich Village, uh, at least at the beginning. But she had been... Part of the Seeger family was based in, in the Washington, D.C. area. And um, I'm not certain of details exactly, but uh, Libba had worked for them as a, a maid, house servant of some sort, and they discovered that, that she could play guitar and sing. And uh, so she got to be pretty well known because she appeared in various places. And she was very, very nice old lady. Well, for me, she was an old lady because I was pretty young at the time. Uh, now I look back on it, I think I was a kid. You know. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, uh, she could play the guitar. Am I wrong? Did she play the left hand? Yes, yes she, she did. Left hand. Yes. Uh, and uh, the last time I remember seeing her was about some years later at a festival in Canada, where she had been doing some performing. But then I remember I was standing around talking with her for a bit, and she was noticing various things that were going on of the people who were there in the folk crowd. And she was saying, see that fella, he's interested in, in that gal. And uh, he's upset because she's talking with this other guy. <laughs> so I mean, she was notice, <laughs> noticing little things like that that were going on. And, uh, but she was a very, a very pleasant lady, and uh, and she certainly could do some good stuff with the guitar and the singing. Mm, mm, mm. Well, Freight Train is her best known yeah, of course, yeah. number. Mm. So, um, how did you come across Lead Belly when song? Well, the same fellow through whom I met Woody Guthrie. I mean, I may have very briefly met Woody at, at a performance somewhere before, but I. I had seen him, but I, I don't think I actually had met him before. But Vic Travis lived in Brooklyn, and he discovered Woody's address, which was also in Brooklyn, out in Coney Island. And I remember the address, 3520 Mermaid Avenue in Coney Island. For some reason, that address has stuck with me. <laughs> uh, uh, and he just went out to Woody's place one time, carrying his guitar, and he knocked at the door or rang the bell or whatever it was. And Woody came to the door and Vic said, Hi, my name's Vic and I like your music. And Woody said, Come on in. <laughs> and so he went in. And apparently they sat and talked a bit and had something to eat and drink and played some tunes, uh, played some songs, things like that. And he started going back. And I don't know, maybe, probably not the second time he went, but maybe third or fourth time he went. He took me along. And then I started going back pretty regularly to Woody's. And then at some point, Woody asked me if I would do some bookings with him. We didn't use the word gigs then, mm -hmm. bookings. And so I, I was happy to. And uh, I, it was uh, generally something like at a union meeting or something like that. And there'd be some time for entertainment. And, and Woody and I would get up and play a few, a few numbers. Well, basically, I was just accompanying Woody. Uh, 
And anyway, Vic also did the same thing with Lead Belly. Lead Belly was living in a place in Manhattan. And I'm a little confused about just where it was. I was thinking it was a little further north than what some of, you know, further north in the city than what other people have been saying. Some people were saying it was around 10th or 12th Street or something like that. And I was thinking it was up in the 40s or 50s. But that's neither here nor there. Anyway, he went around there and introduced himself to Lead Belly. And he was welcomed in. And then he started going back. And uh, it took me along one of the first times. And I think Woody came that time also. And then uh, began to be a not exactly periodic, but semi-periodic kind of thing, of uh, visits to Leadbelly's flat, and various other people came. And I remember some of them, like Freddie Hellerman, who was later in, in The Weavers. Uh, I think Cynthia Gooding was there. I, I just don't remember who yeah. all that. Anyway, there'd be these gatherings. And an interesting thing about, those, about Leadbelly at those gatherings, he was always very formal. First place he'd be dressed, while well, the rest of us were dressed you know, sloppily or uh, informally, he would have sort of knife-edged crease trousers and uh, a vest, or, or what you call a waistcoat hair, hair and uh, a white shirt or some sort of expensive-looking shirt with a bow tie. <clears throat> And when he'd actually perform a number, he would do it as if he was on stage. It would be a, a presentation. Now, my, my guess is that this is all because of what his background was. Uh, a guy who was a black man raised in the South in those days, even nowadays, it's not easy being black in, anywhere in the States. but, but um, uh, if you were black, you got used to white people victimizing you, although you met some who didn't. But I think there was a kind of nervousness in him about white people. So that, if had just Woody gone, I don't think he would have been formal. Uh, but uh, if it wasn't, these were people he didn't know that well except maybe for Woody. And uh, I mean, he, he did know, I'm sure, that we weren't uh, KKK people, you know, Ku Klux Klan, or anything like that, that, that we weren't vicious racists. Or, but was a kind of a nervousness and a formality about it that just meant for him easy to be on, best to be on kind of formal behavior. Now, he never said these things. I mean, I, this is my reading of the way he behaved. Uh, he was always very welcoming and very nice, but, but there was that little formality. Was Lomax around? What? Was Alan Lomax around in the, amongst that bunch of people? I, he might have been there once, but he wasn't regularly there. Mm -hmm. I, I don't recall. I mean, I met Alan various places, but I don't remember him being at these gatherings at Lead Bellies, although he might have been once or twice. Was Lead Belly married? I mean... Well, yes, he was. Uh, I know he well, had I a mean, As far as I know, it was you know, an actual marriage. But I mean, he had a niece called Tiny. Tiny was there often. And, and did she live with him? Well, she was often there. I'm not certain whether she lived... Because I've heard her telling stories about about Woody coming over and her saying, uh, oh yeah, he, we could never get rid of Woody. We'd find him under the ta sleeping under the table in yeah. the morning. Yeah. So she must have stayed there at least. Whether... Yeah, I think she, I think she did. Uh, whether it was just sometimes or all the time, I don't know. Someone mentioned something that she's now in, so, uh, under care. and so She's pretty old. Yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm 87 and I think she was a bit older than me, so she must be in her 90s. Uh, although, I can't swear to that. Uh, but Tiny was, she was there pretty often. And what was his wife's name? Martha, I think.
think. That was Woody's wife, wasn't it? No, no, uh, that was Jeannie. Jeannie. Um, oh, sorry. Uh, but, but I, now I'm a little confused. Uh, <laughs> You're probably right on that. Yeah. Because I remember, I remember there were times when we had a gig and I'd show up and Woody didn't show up. And I remember ringing home to, I think the name was Jeannie. Yeah. Anyway, where's Woody? Oh, we've we got a, a booking tonight and he hasn't turned up. And she said, oh, I don't know. He went out, he went out for something or other on Tuesday. Uh, I, 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 he'll probably be back in, within the week. Uh, or something like that. Now, now, Woody eventually had a condition called, I think, Huntington's Korea. Mm -hmm. Not spelled with a K, like the nation C -H. Korea, or the CH. And this may have been an early uh, symptom of it, that, that, that he sort of just would wander off. And I, I, I don't know, that's just my guess. Mm. Well, did, did Jack Elliott ever go to uh, either Woody's or Leadbelly's place? Well, I know he got to know Woody better than I ever did, but I can't remember. No, I don't think at the beginning that he came to Woody's when I was there. And I don't remember whether he was at, at Lead Bellies. He may well have been. And Sonny and Brownie, Sonny Terry and Brownie McGee, they, they would have gone to Lead Bellies too, would they? I don't remember them being there those oh, nights, right. but I'm sure they would have been to Lead Bellies place at times. But I don't remember them being there for those gatherings. Well, they may have been. So Helen, did to, sorry. I, sorry, I got to know Brownie pretty well over the years. Sonny, I didn't know that well, but I, I met him. Mm. And one time, there was actually a, a gig, put it that way, <laughs> uh, in Greenwich Village. And I don't remember why, it, you know, what what the purpose was of it, or why it was meeting. But I think it was something being run by, was it the Herald Tribune, one of the New York newspapers. Uh, They're putting on a show with this kind of music, and uh, they booked Brownie and Group. And the group consisted of Brownie and Sonny, Brownie's brother Stick, Stick or Sticks, I don't know. Uh, a guy called Tub Bass Bob Harris, and he wanted a banjo player, so he got me, and okay. so I was there and, and that, that thing. Now Brownie's brother Sticks was the, we, we were talking about this the other day, yeah. but he had a rhythm and blues hit with Wine Spody Odie. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Song, but I think he's long since dead. Um, Could be. Well, I mean, Brownie may be as well. Brownie, well, was Brownie awesome. McGee is definitely dead. Yes. Yeah. yeah, he died several <laughs> years ago. Sticks McGee, Barry. Oh, nobody died. Mm -hmm. Sticks McGee. Sticks McGee. Oh, Sticks McGee. Yeah. Would have died when, do you think? Quite a few years ago now. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I don't know exactly. I knew Brownie well, and Stick was certainly dead by that time. Mm. Yeah. Mm. Before you pass on from Lead Belly in this place, can I ask? I'm kind of imagining a black guy living in New York in the, you know, in the mid '40s. I mean, where in New York did he live? Was it in, Har well, in Harlem or? Oh no, no, this is not up in Harlem. I mean, uh, it wasn't that segregated. Okay. There was uh, a sort of area to which a lot of blacks moved was up in Harlem, but there were other blacks living other places in. in Manhattan and yeah. Brooklyn. And maybe Brooklyn. in the village it would have been more mixed perhaps. Yeah, the village. Well, this, but this wasn't in the village. Mm. This was, oh, I, I don't know. My recollection was that it was somewhere around something like 40th Street mm. or 50th Street. 
uh, on the east side. But some people were refer I saw something people were referring to that those gatherings at Lead Belly's place and they were saying something in the teens, you know, like twelfth street or fifteenth street or something mm -hmm. like I just don't really remember where it was. I thought it was further north. But maybe he moved, Tom. Well, but, uh, <laughs> yeah, I'm sure he moved. <coughs> but uh, I'm talking about where we had those gatherings. Yeah, right. Yeah. So yeah. how many years were you playing with Buddy Guffey, Tom? What about? How many years did you play with Buddy Guffey, oh, booking? Well, and... it would be... But including the times I used to just go out to his, mm. his house, maybe two or three years. I see. Uh, but remember, then when I finished high school, I went to City College. And let's see, when did, when did I graduate? City College. Uh, 1950, I think. and CCNY, the City College of New York. And then I went off to graduate school at Yale. And so at that point, then I wasn't around New York that yeah. much. And then I was teaching University of Connecticut and then various other places. But uh, I, I don't think Woody was on the scene anymore. I, I can't remember just when it was. I know we played together at the Lead Belly Memorial concert, which I think was in 49 or 50. Yeah, I think he died in 1950. 51. 51. No, no, I don't think it was 51. No. Think the actual memorial concert was, uh, it was either 49 or 50, I'm pretty sure. Somewhere at home I have yeah. a program, but, but I can't rem remember. But you exactly. played at the Lead Belly Memorial Concert, didn't yeah. you? Well, we were the final number. Oh, right. I mean, the final act. Yeah. Um, what did you play? Do you remember? Guitar. <laughs> and <band laughs> and what and number song? <laughs> no, I don't, I don't remember what numbers. <clears throat> Mainly, when I played with Woody, I was sort of the accompanist yeah, rather so than, than leading songs. Song. Yeah. Well, there, there may have been some traditional songs that Woody and I did. Together. But um, what I remember about that was that there were a lot of people listed and then, you know, for, for, for the performance, and then there were numbers of people who were brought up from the audience to perform. Mm -hmm. And I think Gary Davis was one, if mm -hmm. I remember correctly. Gary Davis. Yeah. Oh, that was a phenomenal guitarist. Yeah. Uh, I can only think of one other person in that field of kind of guitar playing, blues and ragtime, who I'd rate as good or maybe even better on this. And that was Blind Blake, uh, who was a phenomenal player. But I never met him. Did you ever see him play? No, but Blake, no. Uh, I think I think he disappeared in the early 1930s. Sometime. Oh, so exactly. Uh, th someone showed up. A calypso musician showed up who was also called Blind Blake, and some people said, "Oh, it was the same guy, but he moved to the islands no. and began playing." But I I don't believe that. No. Yeah. But he was a remarkable guitarist, and. Uh, uh, and so was Davis, Reverend Gary. Mm. And I got to know Gary Davis a bit. But uh, uh, he appeared there, and various other people were brought up. And then, you know, I'm just on, on that con Red Valley concert. Mm. And then I remember at some point, we were all sitting out on stage. And I remember Woody occasionally got up and went backstage, I think, for a drink. <laughs> uh, at some point, between numbers, someone came up, so one of the officials of the affair came up and said to Woody, because I was sitting right next to him, I heard it, said, Woody, could you, could you hold down the time, because we're running very late, with all these new people you know, showing up on stage, 
uh, were running late, so she could hold it. And we said, oh, no problem, no problem. And But then when we got up there, he spent about the first 15 minutes just talking <laughs> about lead belly and yeah. that other thing. And then we did we did some numbers, but but we didn't hold the time down the way yeah. they wanted. <laughs> Simon was telling me earlier that uh, Woody Guffrey was um, a little bit concerned about your proficiency. He thought you was a, a far far better guitarist than himself, uh, Tom. I, I don't. I, I'm not sure what. what this is when he was looking for a guitarist for his band. Tom, I, I heard a story. Uh -huh. But he was looking for a guitarist yeah. for his band, and somebody mentioned your name. Yeah. Uh, well, I, I, I'm sure you know the story. I, I, may, I don't don't recall. So, so he said no because he's, yeah, no, he said he play you know he plays all that fiddly stuff. Yeah. <laughs> well, of course I didn't play fiddly. <laughs> no, 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 fiddly, fiddly, fiddly music. music. Fiddly guitar. No, I know what you mean. Well, that could be. Uh, Oh, yes, I, as a matter of fact, that does ring a bell. He wasn't saying that I'm too good a player, just I was too too involved in trying to play fancy stuff. <laughs> but he, he just wanted the music kind of straightforward. Yeah. Mm -hmm. that, that makes sense. Where was the, um, the Belly concert, the memorial? Well, it was, what, what was the name of the hall? It was between 6th and 7th Avenues on 43rd or 44th Street, I can't, can't remember what what the name of the theatre was. Yeah. Was it well attended, Tom? Oh yes, it, it, it seemed to be quite uh, well attended with audience and with other people who ended up on stage. <laughs> 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 yeah, I, I, I don't remember if it was absolutely packed or not, but it was well attended. Yeah. It was a good crowd. As you hope, yeah. Uh, so you graduated uh, from University of Mathematics, Tom, is that right? Yeah, I yeah. Yeah, I say I, I used to lecture or teach yeah. mathematics. Uh, and although I've been away from it for a while, I can still count up to one <laughs> quite reliably. <laughs> I sometimes can make it to two. Wow. But, you know, so how long did you, have, did you have did you have a teaching post at university? How long did that last for? Wow, well, it went on for a number of years. Yeah. Uh, the first teaching post I had was at Yale. Uh, I was a graduate assistant there. I mean, I wasn't a, a regular staff member, but I I was teaching. I was taking courses and teaching a fairly elementary course. Then I went up to the University of Connecticut, and I was there. Teaching. I was still supposedly working on my doctorate. I got, got my my MA or MS. I don't know which it was, but uh, but I never uh, actually completed the doctorate. I was too busy playing music okay. and running around and doing things. Mm -hmm. And uh, theoretically, I was still supposedly working on the doctorate while I was uh, up at Yukon, and then. Went from there to uh, to University of Maryland, and so that was like I was there, I guess, for another three years. Must have been at University of Connecticut for about three or four years. Uh, at University of Maryland, I think it was three years. Then a year or two, probably two, teaching at Skidmore College. Then something in Pennsylvania, was it University of Pennsylvania? And then oh, somewhere else. And then uh, after we left the States and came over to Europe, while we were living in, in Stockholm, uh, there's another American that I knew from, I think from City College. Who, who was also there in Stockholm and was teaching at uh, Uppsala University, a course mainly for third world students who, who were there. Uh, and then he had, he had to take off, he had, there was something he had, an obligation somewhere in Russia, the Mathematical Institute. 
So I ended up taking over his job. So I taught for about half a year at Uppsala University in English. They wanted someone to be teaching in English rather than Swedish because I say the students in the course were from third world countries. Mm -hmm. And while almost all of them knew English reasonably well, only a few knew Swedish much. Then... Tell me your I mean, reason we'll, for leaving America, please. What? Your reason well, for we're leaving America. Well, we're talking about a little bit yeah, later right, on, right, John, right, jump uh, ahead a bit. Yeah. Uh, yeah. He's in Sweden uh, now. No, 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 yeah, I'm taking yeah, it back right, to that. Right. Right. And then, let me say, then over here for a short while I taught at uh, Birkbeck College. Mm -hmm. And then a short while I taught at a secondary school somewhere in South London. Uh -huh. I don't remember what name it was, but that was the last actual teaching I did. That ended up, actually I was quite ill at one point there, so I ended up having to drop that. I think it was only one one year or one term that I taught there. Yeah. yeah. All right, Tom, we take a break now for something to eat, and afterwards, after a little break, we yeah. have a little natural about the new city ramblers, shall we? All right. New yeah. lost city ramblers. A lost city ramblers. <coughs> <well. coughs> <Can, coughs> new <coughs> city ramblers. Can I just later. hold you in position? Lost. I want to get close up. Oh, all right. Okay. Can I have you looking at Tom, please? Mm -hmm. Uh, and we, you know, it's not look, easy, really. Is he supposed to so, look in horror? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> can, can you look as if you're, ah, you're no, taking in a real, a good, a good answer? Ah, so I see. Look so, at him, please, so and we, just nodding. Yeah, please. Yeah. Look so, at him. basically, I really enjoy yeah. mushroom and rhubarb yeah. pizza. I get, <laughs> keep, <laughs> mushroom and rhubarb. Keep talking. Go talking. Sit oh, nodding. Oh, I'll see. Just yeah. uh, and nod, please. Uh, pause and nod again. Looking at him, please. Mm -hmm. And a smile. No. <laughs> Come on, we can do a bit better. A on. smirk, anyway. <laughs> yes. That's, that's <laughs> lovely. Stuff with that's Photoshop, it. Yeah, yeah. And, and we're going to take some photographs. Here's a couple of photographs now. Yeah. Both of you. Do you want to stand up? No, no, just do it as, uh, it, as uh, is. No, yeah, as okay. is. Tom, would you want to look at the camera? Yeah. This first one look is the camera the here. one, actually. That'd just be nice. the uh, exposure, if I may. Yeah. Um, Chance to do that, yeah. Okay, All right, now let's try and take some more ones. Keith, you can smile. Yeah. So can you, Tom? You look at the one I just do it on you. Do more, if I may. Now I can pull a funny face. If that helps. That's lovely, Simon. Thank you. Thanks very much. I'm ready. Good, lovely. Welcome back to part two, Tom. Well, Tom. Tell us all about the Lost City <coughs> Ramblers. Uh, when did they start? <coughs> Uber in it, and um, what year would that be when it all began? Really? Oh, let's see what year. It was. It's a little hard to remember exactly what year, but uh, I'm sure there's a way of tracking it down. But, but I was teaching down at University of Maryland, and John Cohn was visiting me. And there was, of course, I had known John up in New York, mm. of course. And there was a uh, guy in the Washington area, I don't remember who it was, or his name was, anyway, uh, who had a program, a sort of folk music program on one of the local radio stations. And he rang. Uh, and said to me, well, I think John Cohn is visiting you this weekend, isn't he? And I said, yeah. And he said, do you think you two guys would be interested in coming down and playing a few numbers on my program? And I asked John, yeah, fine. Yeah. And he said, and as a matter of fact, also Mike Seeger, who at that point was living in Baltimore, which is not that far from Washington, says, he's down in Washington area also. Maybe the three of you could get together and do something. Well, fine. And then he, he got in touch with Mike, and Mike was in. So we all went down there, and we, you know, sat around for a while. What about this number? About that? You know, you know. Can, can you do that one on the banjo or this one on the guitar or something? Yeah. So we finally decided on a little program of three or four numbers. I, I don't remember how many, but something like three or four. I 
uh, and uh, we did them on the program. And then afterwards, I remember John said something. He said, you know, I bet Mo Ash would be interested in recording us. And, oh, that sounds good. He said, I'll, I'll ask Mo when I get back to New York. And he did, and Mo was interested. And so we, went, we started to have a session up there uh, at Mo's studio, well, the, the building where he had it wasn't exactly a studio, but it served as one. Uh, and then we went down for lunch to a local place. And then we were having lunch, and Moa said, what do you guys want to call yourselves? You could just say Tom Paley, Mike Seeger, John Cohen. But uh, you could have a group name of some sort. So we started thinking of words and things. And, you know, the various words that are likely to show up. Ramblers is a fairly common sort of noun for a, a country group. Uh, and now John and I lived in New York City, and Mike didn't, but I think he had actually been born in New York City. And we couldn't call it the New York City Ramblers. That didn't make it. Ended up be being the New Lost City Ramblers. I don't remember. Who came up with which words? Uh, uh, but but between us, we came up with the name. Now I remember years later, when when the group was breaking up, uh, John claimed to have made the name up himself, because he wanted to cut me out of uh, a share in the rights to the name. Uh, well, I mean, even just having played in the group, I should have had some share in it. But, but the whole reason for the breakup, well, the main reason anyway, was that now there had been a guy who was often up at the People's Songs office, a fellow named Harvey Matuso. He was up there and he did a little sort of volunteer work in the offices. A lot of the people who worked there just did sort of voluntary stuff, helping out with one thing or another. But Harvey was just a guy I knew slightly from seeing him at the at the People's Songs office. And then suddenly there he was in the newspapers. He was a great American hero because uh, he had been a plant by the FBI and uh, or the Fat Boys Institute, well, the Federal Bureau of Investigation. Um, uh, anyway, he... Uh, he was giving a story about how all these dangerous red banjo players. <laughs> and they gave all sorts of names. Now, uh, I didn't know that my name had been given, but I wasn't so surprised when I found out some years later that uh, my name had been given. And... Uh, that came about when the Ramblers, this is some years later than the time when Harvey became his national hero. Uh, we, uh, incidentally, Harvey later wrote a book or some sort of article, a book, I think, about, called False Witness, about how he had lied for the money and, and the publicity. And anyway, this is some some time after the publication of, of Harvey's work. Uh, we were the Ramblers were going to be on this so some one of the big nationwide radio programs. I don't think it was TV. Maybe it was, but I think it was just radio. Uh, and some sta some of the network officials came around to me. They didn't get anything to Mike or John, but they came to me and said, uh, uh, your name was given uh, for the Un-American Activities Committee by Harvey Matuso. And I said, what? Uh, again, I wasn't terribly surprised. Well, I mean, terrible. It was a, something I wasn't certain of, and it was terrible, but I wasn't that surprised because I 
knew he had been giving names. And I said, what did he say? And apparently it was, this may not be word for word, but it was roughly, oh, Tom Perry was a member of the Communist Party, and as such he was part of the Soviet espionage apparatus in America. Now, I was never a member of the Communist Party. That was partly due to the fact that the guy who kept on trying to recruit me was so dogmatic about everything <laughs> that I just didn't want to join. Uh, but uh, they, uh, uh, anyway, what the station guy was saying is, the Un-American Activities Committee wants to, wants to uh, interview you. And I said, well, I'm not going to inter any interview with them. They're, but my political uh, beliefs and activities, no business of theirs. And I ended up not being interviewed by the Un-American Activities Committee, but then we stopped getting jobs in certain sort of situations. I mean, we still got some small bookings, but Mike and John felt that by my not being willing to testify, uh, I was costing them money and and status as, as, as a group. And they decided to get rid of me. So they got a hold of Tracy and they said, you're out. To me, not to Tracy. Uh, and oh, well, that was the story of how, how my involvement in the Ramblers ended. Oh, yeah. But that was also not, not so long before the time when Claudia and I, my, my then wife and I, uh, decided we wanted to leave the country, at least for a while, because, uh, you know, we had been out protesting about there, about American involvement in Vietnam and various other places, and the atmosphere was getting kind of poisonous there, and we just wanted to go away for a while, and we went off to Sweden. Mm -hmm. But uh, this happened before we decided we were, we were leaving, but it was part of what led to our deciding to, to leave. It's extraordinary that Mike Segan <coughs> took that line. Well, that's what I Well, to. Mike was not particularly political. He was more concerned with... I, I'm, I'm, I'm yeah, sure... But, but I'm, I mean, how did, how did Pete and Peggy and people, the, the rest of the Segan family, react to his behavior? Well, I don't think... I, I wasn't in the discussions with them. No. I, I don't think <laughs> they would have... It approved yeah. of, of Mike's attitude, but uh, uh, it's a terrible that that's the kind of thing that the that McCarthy did to yeah. ordinary people. Well, I I think um, at, at at this time it wasn't McCarthy anymore, but it was that that committee. I'm I'm, I'm not House absolutely sure. Uh, Huac House well, on American Affairs. Yeah, committee. yeah. But well, the general, to know, no one tells us the Un-American Committee. Yeah. <laughs> This guy, Harvey Matuso, was quite an interesting character because he exposed thousands, hundreds of thousands, I think hundreds of people, yeah. and was lying throughout because he went all over the country exposing people that he'd never met, yeah. working for, um, actually for Roy Cohn, who was the, uh, and, and Nixon, who were working for oh, yeah. McCarthy, or, or, or anyway, yeah. earlier working for McCarthy, the House on American Affairs. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. after all that, the only time he ever told the truth was he wrote a book. Oh, I mean, if he strikes false me witness, from yeah. called false, false witness. witness. He was a total self-publicist and up his own backside to a large yeah. extent. But he wrote this book called False Witness, where he admitted that everything he'd done was a lie, and that was the only time he ever told the truth. And for that book, he was jailed for four years for perjury, <laughs> not <laughs> not for perjuring against people like you, yeah, which but, is what he'd actually done. Yeah. But for but they they jailed him because if they hadn't jailed him, they'd have had to admit that all these people were were ostracized through perjury. Yeah. So they accused him of perjury in his book and locked him up for four years. Mm -hmm. And what yeah. is really wonderful, if you get onto YouTube now, Tom, you can see <laughs> Matuso shortly before he died. He died in 2002. But shortly before, he's doing a gig in somewhere in California with some musicians behind him, and he's telling stories. And he introduces himself, says, oh, I spent four years in the Chokey because of McCarthyism. <laughs> <laughs> it's wonderful. It's absolutely wonderful. Fantastic. Yeah, before we leave for Lost City Rams and move on to when you go to Sweden, Tom, um, obviously um, you played uh, folk festivals with the band, did you? Yeah. 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 
the Newport Folk Festival, was it? Or, yeah, yeah. And a number of others. I can't remember mm. exactly all of what ones we played at, but Newport, we definitely were there. And I think, I think we were there a couple of times, but I, I may be wrong about that, but it seems to me that one of the times, that, and I think it was Newport, when we were there, Bob Dylan also got up and performed and was made a big hit somehow. Uh, I think I think that was the Newport Festival. I don't I didn't actually meet him then. The only time I met him was at Izzy Young's Folklore Center in New York. Mm. Did I mention uh, the story of that? I was yep. introduced. I think it was by John Cohen. Now I had never heard of of Bob Dylan at that time. Because remember, I was, although Dylan had built up a reputation for himself in Greenwich Village, uh, I wasn't aware of him. Uh, of course, I've been off teaching in various colleges away from New York. And uh, anyway, someone, I think it was John Cohn, uh, when we went, we went to the Folklore Center uh, on McDougal Street, the same street Pete Seeger lived on, but opposite side and a little further down. Um, uh, Izzy Young was an old friend of mine, the guy who ran, ran the Folklore Center, and who uh, I knew from high school, we both Bronx High School of Science. And uh, anyway, so whoever it was that brought me there, introduced me to Bob Dylan. Bob Dylan happened to be there. I said, oh, Tom Paley, Bob Dylan, Bob Dylan, Tom Paley. And then he said, and I don't remember which it was, it was either Bob has just cut his first record or Bob is just going to cut his first record. And I remember saying, well, good luck with your record. And he said, thanks. That was the extent of my real contact with Dylan. Mm -hmm. uh, Did he come across Odetta? Oh, well, yeah, Odetta I had yeah. met. Uh, I don't say I ever really knew her very well, but I mean, I had met her a number of times. She may even have been at Red Bellies sometimes. I, yeah. I, I, I don't remember. No. She might have been. Well, a lot of people who might have been. Uh, <laughs> it's interesting that my grandson, who's just come back from Canada, plays and been playing bass with a group there. A while, yeah. um, and um, he's he was um, always talking to guys there about our band, the City Ramblers, um, and they were saying, "No, you've got it wrong. You must mean the new lost City Ramblers. <laughs> <laughs> You're still very famous there, yeah. apparently, yeah. the band is <coughs> in certain circles." Yeah. 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 So then, Tom, with everything that was going on in America, you decided to uh, go to Sweden. Yeah. Well, well, we. I hadn't decided it was a permanent move no. or anything, but partly the background of this sort of thing was the un-American un activities bunch, but uh, also it was America invading Vietnam and getting involved in a lot of other places, and, you know, so that we had the right to determine what governments people had in other countries somehow. And uh, we were out protesting a good deal. and. Uh, the whole atmosphere about about that sort of thing was getting kind of poisonous, I think. And we we wanted to go away at least for a while. Now both Claudia and I had uh, taken some German in school, and and we had gone out and seen a lot of Bergman's films, the Swedish director, mm -hmm. and. Uh, uh, when, when I see those films, I would think sometimes, sometimes I catch some words and think I understood a little bit here and there. Uh, and then, but partly because of knowing a little bit of German and English, of course, there's a lot of English spoken in Sweden. But uh, anyway, I got a hold of the book, Teach Yourself Swedish, just a little, little book. And... Uh, uh, I found it was quite easy to learn enough so I could read relatively simple Swedish 
and understand it. Uh, took took a while longer to learn it reasonably well, but but I found learning the the rudiments of it was fairly quick. And uh, so we decided. Also, we we'd heard a lot to the effect that Sweden was a good place to live in, and wasn't part of either NATO or the Warsaw Pact or anything like that, and that it seemed a pretty democratic country. Uh, and so we decided, let's go there. Uh, and. We had saved up some money and figured we probably would have enough to live out a year. But if, if we didn't, my parents could have lent us some money. They, they said they would if necessary. So we went. I took a you know, steamboat to Sweden and uh, we liked it there. And I did find that I was able, that there was an interest in folk music there. Well, certainly an interest in Swedish folk music, but also there were quite a few people around, at least in Stockholm, where we ended up, uh, who were interested also in American folk music. And so I was able to get jobs on occasion, uh, singing, playing. I didn't play fiddle yet, that came later, but... Uh... Tom, just, just going back to, to the Ramblers and earlier, just for a minute, yeah. what, from, from what I know of what was going on in the States at the time, there was the Weavers and Pete Seeger and there was a lot of what I would call popular folk music. It was folk music that was partly had a political stance, it came from all mm. over the world, but it was a sort of pop, pop, popular version of it. What you did in the City Ramblers was something different. You were looking for, you were obviously going back into earlier music and looking for roots, which nobody else, as far as I know, did at that time. Where, where did that come from? I mean, who, where, what were your influences and what were the influences of the... Well, that I heard... Hmm. You were looking for people like the Skillet Lickers and... Yeah. I don't know, uh, what, uh, what was his name, McCoy, um, no, not McCoy, um, well, there's a wonderful white ragtime guitarist, oh, it's gone. <laughs> oh, no, I, I don't remember, but, uh, but, but, but people like that, uh, Riley Puckett and so on, all yeah. those kind of people. Well, well, first place, as I say, I had listened to these radio stations, so, like, like this one, WAAT, in yeah. New Jersey, that played a lot of country music, much of which was the more modern stuff, but they also played a fair bit of the Carter family and Uncle Dave and the Skillet Lickers and people like that. And I, I liked that. It, it sounded real somehow. And then I also managed to listen to recordings, uh, Library of Congress recordings, and some of those really spoke to me. And uh, so that's why I moved in that direction. I, I was never that fascinated by the country music that sounded just like it was sort of pop music with a country accent. Yeah. I mean, I didn't hate it, but it wasn't my thing. And I, when I heard the Carter family, I heard Uncle Dave, I heard the Blue Sky Boys, or uh, Charlie Poole, or... Gene uh, Ritchie, I Gene, Gene I, I, I knew in New York, yeah. yeah. Uh, yeah, I liked her singing also very much. Yeah. Uh, she wasn't much of an instrumentalist. Yeah. Uh, I, I was much more interested in the instrumental side yeah. than well, well, not. It wasn't as if I was disinterested in the uh, in the vocal stuff either. But but I really did like so sort of the banjo playing and the guitar playing, and the guitar playing including. Uh, the playing of a lot of the black musicians <coughs> and the kind of way a guitarist in a country string band, an old-time country string band, 
which use lots of bass runs, and I like mm -hmm. I like that sort of thing. Uh, but you were, you must have been also buying old records or something. Where did you find blind Alfred Reed? You know, how can a poor man stand such times and live? I I don't remember whether it's one that I heard elsewhere or whether I actually had a copy of it. But yes, there were shops. There were a few record shops on Sixth Avenue, around 40, 43rd, 44th, 45th Street, somewhere, a little, just above 42nd Street anyway, and for a number of blocks up. There were several old record shops, and I found I could go in there and you start looking through, and think, oh, this, this looks like something I'd be interested in, you know, Carter family or whatever. We would sing out as well. What? The, the magazine Sing Out we used to get. Well, that? yeah, but that that wasn't right at the beginning, I think. But no, I don't quite know when it was. But I yeah, remember I don't we used to either. Get it. But yeah, but that <coughs> no, it was Erwin Silber, I think, was mm -hmm. the one, the editor of that. Yeah, and and that was a magazine that also was quite political. Yes. Uh, Left-wing political. I was like, there's such a thing as right-wing politics too, but I've never been well interested in it. Interested in knowing what's going on, but but it's never been my my direction. Uh, but we used to. We used to. It must have been. Well, I don't know. Early fifties. We used to get copies of Sing Out over here. You know, Hasted yeah. and. The London yeah. Youth Choir and all us yes. lot that were involved in the stuff. Yeah. And that was how the, the magazine Sing, the English magazine Sing, came to be published. It was based yeah. around the idea of Sing Out, you know, the American yeah. book. Yeah, I, I can't really place exact times or anything yeah. like that. I definitely think of you as, I mean, what was going on then was Tsena 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 by Pete Seeger and We Shall Overcome and um, quite a lot of just what I'd call popular folk music from all over the world, but yes, there was which some was of that. not to me didn't have a lot of content compared with that stuff you were digging out. Yeah, and also Woody's stuff, you know, was quite a number yeah. of his. Songs well, Woody was an important there. influence on yeah. me, I think, uh, and particularly some of the stuff Woody and Cisco did together. Yeah, Cisco Houston, mm. um, because that also sounded a lot like some of the brother combinations that there used to be. Uh, the Blue Sky Boys and the Monroe Brothers and the well, various other brothers, Carlisle Brothers. But Cisco uh, was in the Merchant Navy for a while, wasn't he? And he, yeah, he, he picked up stuff all yeah, over the place. Yeah, and I think Woody was too for a while during was the he? war. Uh -huh. yeah. Seems, I think I'm right about that. Was Cisco Houston, was he New York based as well, Tom, was he? Not that I know of. I, I think he was there sometimes. He did some occasional things there, but no, I, I don't know where he lived, actually. No, no, no. Uh, but I don't think it was in, in the New York area. I saw him at the Troubadour one time. What? I can't remember when, but he here played, in London. Uh, he played over here. Cisco did? Cisco, yeah. Yeah. Jack Emmett or by himself? No, I think he just showed up, you know, and played again. Yeah. Yeah. Oh. So, hey, you don't remember roughly what? When it what, would have been? Yeah. I don't really. I think it would have been late 50s, maybe early 60s. Yeah, so still, still before the time when I came over. Yes. I, <coughs> I came to Europe. Uh, well, I mean, I'd been once when I was a little child. But, uh, but we actually moved over at, at the very end of uh, 62, mm. the beginning of 63, and we moved to Stockholm. It's interesting that Izzy Young, of course, moved to Scandinavia. To Stockholm, yeah. And I he think he may still be around, I'm not sure. Oh, yeah, well, well he was very recently. I yes. I assume he still is. Uh, he has a place called Folklore Centrum right, yeah. in Stockholm. And who is this? Israel Young, who ran yeah. the Folklore Centre in America. Yeah, he ran Folklore Centre in yeah. Stockholm. Oh, because when... when um, well, before that in New York. Yeah. 
Yes. When I went to, when I was working in the Elizabethan room and I went to part of our itinerary, when we went to uh, Canada and America was, was New York, and before we went, um, I was asking around, you know, how should we find the folk scene when we get to New York? And uh, they said, oh, go, go to <laughs> Izzy's place, uh, you know, go to the folklore centre. And then we, we did, and he showed us all around New York, and then he came mm. and stayed with us in Britain and got introduced to Bert Lloyd, who he was absolutely dying yeah. to meet and so on. So <laughs> yeah. it's great, you know. And, but I haven't kind of seen him since he moved to Scandinavia. But Oh, well, no, I've, I've, of course I've seen him over there, lot, yeah. but also he's been over here a couple of times. Uh, not very recently, I think. Within the last, within the last it must five have been years. Late, late sixties, he moved from what? New York, was it? Uh, Israel moved from New York in the late sixties. Well, it was af after the time when we actually yeah. lived in Stockholm. And sixty-three, four, and five. Yeah. So I think it was later than sixty-five. It definitely was. Because yeah. I was in New York in 64, he came to visit us 65, and it was a year or two after that that he moved Yeah, yeah that's, that's about right. Yeah. Yeah. So your time spent in Sweden, Tom, was about four years, was it? Four? No, we actually lived there. Well, I'll say we were domiciled there. <laughs> we, we actually were resident there for about three years. Well, I mean, maybe the first months you couldn't count us as resident, but... Mm -hmm. uh, but, but, but 63, 4, and 5. And you gained an interest in traditional Swedish folk music? Well, that that mainly came later. I see. Uh, although I heard some Swedish fiddling, I thought, oh, that's a that's nice, nice sound. But uh, uh, we moved over here, and my son was born here, Ben. Uh, and... Uh, well, in 67, I guess. And then in 68, my wife split off from me. As I think I said, she and the husband from the other couple who shared a flat with, decided they belonged together. And so I was on the out. Yeah. Um, and, uh, but at least Claudia didn't keep me from seeing Ben. I've known of cases where when there's a split up, you know, the wife sometimes has, has control of the kid and doesn't want the, the father around. But I didn't get that kind of treatment. So I saw quite a bit of Ben. And then he took up fiddle. Uh, my recollection was that he had some violin lessons from someone at school. But the other day I mentioned that and he said no. I, I, I don't know for certain. Uh, anyway, he started playing fiddle. And I think maybe partly uh, his interest may have been because he knew fiddle was an important instrument in the music that I played, even though I didn't play it yet. Uh, so when he was six, he started playing fiddle. When he was eight, his teacher had said that he needed uh, to move. He was playing, uh, I think, a, a quarter size fiddle, as they call it. Oh, it, that doesn't mean it's actually a quarter of the size of a, of a full part, but it's a size that's called a quarter size. And the teacher said, time for him to move up to a half or maybe even directly to a three-quarter. And my father had sent me some money to get Ben a present, and I knew a guy in Portobello Road who had a music stall. And I went to him and I... I I ended up buying uh, uh, a half-size outfit and a three-quarter size outfit for Ben. And I think I paid 15 for the smaller one and 20 for the for the bigger one. And th they were not good instruments, but they were <coughs> a half-size and a three-quarter size. And they included, uh, they were playable. But uh, and they included bows and and case, and I think a lump of rosin or some sort. Well, maybe Ben had the rosin already. But anyway, anyway, at the same time, I was thinking, you know, fiddle is such an important. And by then, I had been over to Sweden uh, a few times, and began hearing much more of the Swedish fiddle music. 
and thinking, it would be nice to play fiddle because <laughs> <coughs> first it's an important in instrument in the music that I do play, and also I'd like to try playing some of the Swedish tune. So I ended up buying myself a full-size violin, a cheap one also, and spent some time fixing it up a little bit and learning to scratch out simple tunes. And the thing is, I had already been able to play a little bit of mandolin, and the basic tuning on a mandolin is the same as the basic tuning on a fiddle, except that the mandolin has pairs of strings rather than single strings. So I had a rough feel for where I'd find the notes, and so I picked up fiddle fairly quickly. Not that I was any great player. I'm not a great player now. My son is, but I, sure I, I can play the fiddle pretty well, yeah. yeah. When my shoulder isn't bothering me too much. I heard both of you at the cellar upstairs about a year ago. So oh, yeah, yeah. It was amazing. He really is a good fiddler. He's one of the best around on the scene, anyway. I mean, not, I'm not comparing him with with classical violinists, but the people I've heard on the folk scene in Britain. Does he make a living at it? Yes. Well, he makes part of a living at it, but he also he has a job working for a website company. Oh. And they know that he has music jobs, so he's on flexible time. And uh, that's probably what earns him more of his living than. If anybody hasn't seen him, he's an absolutely fantastic fiddler. Yeah, Certainly well, one of the best. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, you, you play together quite, I mean, he's in your band now, isn't he, Tom? Well, the New Deal string band, yeah. That's Ben and me and Joe Locker. Well, Joe Locker is, well, Lockeritz was his name originally. He's from New York, and I knew him over there. And he was, Fairly largely a bluegrass banjo player, but but he could also play old time style, and uh, we got together. See, originally it was Joe and me, and oh, I've forgotten the name of the, the first fiddle we had, but then he dropped out, and Robin Arzoni uh, took over the fiddle part. Then. Eventually, when, when Robin dropped out, Ben moved in and began to do some of the playing. Uh, but, yeah, I, mean, I do some some playing just, just with Ben. We yeah. do some duo gigs and we do some trio gigs with Joe and Ben and me. Perhaps you'd like to tell us, Tom, about uh, some of the venues you played was since you've been in the UK over the past 40 years, some of the, the clubs you played, venues. Oh, well, well, first of all, some of the regular clubs around London that I go to pretty often. Mm. Sharps, which is a Cecil Sharp mm -hmm. house on Tuesdays. Uh, the Islington Folk Club has had a pub called The Horseshoe in Clockamwell Close. That's a Thursday night club. I may still make it tonight. Huh? Uh, Fridays, there's some Fridays. There's a club called the uh, Musical Traditions. Uh, they meet at, at a pub called the King and Queen, right, right near the post office tower. And uh, I'll be there tomorrow. Tomorrow they're having, there are two American gals from the South who are playing. Uh, and uh, so I'll, I'll also be there. Ken, who runs the club, you know, so make sure you bring, bring the guitar this time too. <laughs> so you know, play something on the guitar. For the King and Queen, as you mentioned just now, as you probably know, is a long established folk music venue yeah. in London. It's been going since the early 60s. And well, Bob Dylan allegedly made his first ever British appearance at really? that pub. Yeah. And so did Paul Simon, by all accounts. Uh -huh. yeah. 
Well, I, I know I know there's been folk music activity there for a long time. I don't know the details. No, no. I may have I may have heard that about Dylan, but I I don't remember. For sure. no, no. What about during the sixties and seventies? What venues, music places were you playing in those days? Do you remember any names of them songs? Well, the Singers Club for one thing. Oh, yeah. uh, you and McCall and Peggy Singers oh, Club. Yeah. And that moved to a few different places. And there was an Islington Folk Club then, well, the ancestor of the present one, but it was elsewhere, uh, sort of very close to Sadler's Wells, but uh, where you come down, before you turn into Rosebury Princess Avenue. Princess Louise. What? Is it Princess Louise? No, I don't know. No. I think Princess Louise is a place where the Singers Club was at one time. They, they watch for us. Yeah. It was our band, the Ramblers, that first started playing music there. And then yeah. um, when we went on our trip abroad, Nancy Whiskey took over, and then the singer, Singers Club established yeah. there. Yeah. No, but, but... That would have been the you come down. late 60s, 70s. Oh, well, what's, what's the name of the road? I've, so I live right, right by the Angel on Pentonville Road. But then, if you follow the road down south from there, Rosebury Avenue. What? Rosebury Avenue. Well, no, it's not Rosebury Avenue till it gets to a corner. Then Rosebury Avenue takes off. But uh, was it a pub? Yeah. Yes, this was a pub. It's not there as a pub anymore. No. Uh, it was an upstairs thing. Because there was also the pub. Oh, it's no good me trying to remember the name. Where we used to they. They used to have jazz every weekend and things like that there. Uh, and it got burnt down in a fire at one point, I don't know. Um, that, that sounds familiar. Something. Yeah. It was sort of the, the King's Cross end of the Farringdon Road. Well, not quite the King's Cross end, but sort of down the Farringdon Road, more or less opposite where the, um, the post office um, headquarters. Mount Pleasant. Mount yeah. Pleasant, yeah. 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 Oh well, yeah. Well, that's Mount Pleasant. Uh, that that's right up near the top of, of was a Gray's Inn Road there. Yeah. 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 So tell us a little about the Brit some of the British folk musicians you would have worked with over, since you've been in the UK. Well, you and McCall, <laughs> <laughs> Peggy yeah. Seeger. Yes. Well, Peggy was American, but yeah. she was living over here. Uh, then, like for instance, a fellow named Robin Gillen, uh, who uh, is on on the record we did. Well, the the most recent record that we did that was actually already out uh, is a thing called Tom Paley's Old Time Moonshine Review, <clears throat> and uh, uh, that was. Uh, some fellows got together. Well, there was a fellow named Ski Williams, who was an artist and also a music enthusiast. He got the idea, hey, let's do a record of Tom Paley and Friends. And he got some people interested and uh, did this record. And it's, it's a pretty good record. Now, we've done a second one, which is going to have a, uh, it's going to come out on May 31st. So it's in, impending. So, uh, and that's just called Paley and Son. It involves some of the same other people, uh, like there was a, a bass player, uh, Johnny. I can't. Uh, oh, my mind's gone blank. Well, that's a more familiar condition in recent years, a blank mind. Uh, and this guy Robin Gillen is on it, and a couple other people, but it mainly featuring Ben and me. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's called Paley and Son. And the, the company is called Hornbeam. Just a moment, I wonder if I actually... Have that record with me. Well, the, the pub at Mount Pleasant was called the New Merlin's Cave, I just remembered. Oh, oh is that right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah that's, that's right. And Johnny Bridgewood is oh, the, the bass player. Yeah. And Robin Gillen's on it. 
uh, Tom and Ben, a guy named Jason Steele was on it. And Dave Morgan, who was a recording engineer, he has played drums and things in some sort of other gathering. And so on a few of the numbers, he, maybe only two numbers, I don't remember, he plays a sort of bit of rhythm stuff. Oh, well, that, that's that. Yeah. Well, it leads us nicely, if you like, to what? chat a little bit about your recording career, because you work for numerous labels, a lecturer. Both yeah. ways. Yeah, well, I think the first Argo. the first recording, I think, was that an Argo recording, the first one? Or, or was that a lecture? No, that wasn't a lecture yet. I can't remember. It was just a friend of mine uh, wanted to go down to uh, a place where a guy was having a few auditions for people to record for his record label, uh, not one of the big labels. And I went along, and it ended up, as the guy asked me to do a, a record, so I did. It was a little solo, 10-inch LP. And uh, then I did quite a bit of recording for Folkways, you know, with the Ramblers. But the, the other recordings, it's kind of hard to remember what I did in what order. You uh, mentioned Mo Ash. Well, that yeah. was folkways, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah, but that was, yeah, uh, uh, that was sort of with the Ramblers kind of thing. Uh, that, that's when, uh, at the end of the original session playing for that radio station yeah. around Washington, D.C., uh, John had the idea of asking Mo, and so we did, and we did record for them. Uh, I'm probably leaving some things out, but... How many records did the Ramblers make? Do you, know, do you remember? How many albums on the Well, while I was still with them, it was about five, yeah. five or six. I think. That was in quite a so short space of time, time, wasn't it? It was well, like one yeah, a year well, or something. What? That's like one a year, isn't it? Something like that. Uh, and that was all for Folkways? Yeah, I think all for Folkways. I don't remember that we recorded for anyone else, though it's quite possible we did. Oh, oh the, the, there were probably some things where we played at a festival, yeah. and the festival people issued a recording that included a couple of our numbers. I think that did happen, but those are not major recording projects for us. Uh, then, then over here, uh, uh, sort of make my mind blank out. I don't know. Tom, can I ask you something? You taught Ry Cuda at one stage, didn't you? I gave him a lesson anyway. When was that? And where? It was in Los Angeles, or well, Hollywood, I guess. There was a pub called the Ash Grove where I used to perform sometimes. And he came around and he asked a, a, a lesson or something. I don't remember just specifically what it was he wanted to learn. He already was a pretty good player. And this would be, let's see, I have to think, when we left the States, 62, the end of 62, this would probably have been 59, 58, I, I don't remember exactly. Wow, so he must have been very young. Well, he was pretty young. He was in his teens, anyway. Yeah. And I don't remember just what I taught him specifically, but he wanted some things, and I taught him some things. And then he brought along, what's his name? The guy who played banjo, and I gave him a lesson. That's make me think I, uh, I'm probably going off and slowly into dementia. But Remembering names is always a... It's always difficult. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I can come still come remember mine. <laughs> 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 I'm, uh, 
Uh, <laughs> Ben's Ben's dad. Uh, <laughs> Tom. Tom. Oh. That, that's, yeah. I see. I think what um, a population at large in the UK must have come uh, quite a shock to discover you finally on the Tom Jones show recently. I was, I, I was, sort, live I was sort of Sanders. shocked. Yeah. <laughs> Tell us how that came about, yeah. Tom. Well, it was through the people behind uh, our, our recent records, the, the Hornbeam uh, bunch. They, I don't know, I assume they contacted Tom Jones. It might have been the other way around, but I don't think so. Uh, and I did that. I also had appeared on Keris Matthews' show and on a few other shows. They got a few not not particularly well paid gigs, but just <laughs> some things, you know, what appearing on, on someone's Jones program. Tom? What? What songs did you do for Tom Jones? Was it songs or tunes you did no, for Tom tunes. Jones? Uh, I, I don't really remember. Do you remember what you did? No. When was that? About Very three, three years ago. Mm. Mm. <coughs> did you record anything for Topic with Bill Leader? Uh, um, yes, we, we did a Topic recording. Is that label still going? Yeah. What? Topic is. Yeah. is it topic. Going, yeah. I think so. Right, I loads of their records. I met them with a friend of mine. I've never seen them since. <laughs> yeah. I think it's run by a guy called Tony Engel. Yes, yeah, okay. so Bill isn't yeah. involved in everything. Uh, yes, yeah, so what was the topic record? I don't know, I, I don't look at my own records that often. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, of course, I know those songs already, <laughs> if I can remember them. What? Have you had a favourite, any songs over the years, that a favourite song or tune from over the years that you go back to? A favourite tune, so, favourite song, John is asking. Oh. Oh well, yeah. I mean, there are songs that I suppose are still among my favourites. Uh, oh, fly around, my pretty little miss is something uh, I used to do. Uh, sporting life blues quite a bit. I'm a little bit rusty on that. Uh, and uh, so I've gotten kind of rusty on that. Uh, actually, I find the thing is, when I do a gig, I take guitar, banjo, and fiddles. But many of my appearances are just the sort of thing of showing up at a folk club and doing one or two numbers. And I generally just take the fiddles. The fiddle's my new toy. Mm. It's not that new now. Yeah, I guess 40 years now. But it still feels new because I, I don't have the kind of control over it that I've had over, over guitar and banjo. 40 years, yes. A long time, Tom. Well, well, well time is marching well, right. on. So. Wait, yes. I was, um, I was 47 when I started. I'm 87. Right, yes, yeah. Just 40 years. Yeah. So um, there's maybe a couple of questions that Simon or Hilda may want to ask you that uh, I'll probably left out more than... Well, I'd, I'd actually like to see Tom play, Tom play a tune. But well, I'm if, sure if he will. Going to, yeah. like um, I was sitting next to you. You don't still play How Can a Poor Man Stand Such Times and Live, do you? Well, I sort of think we may, I haven't done it for a long time. Because it's very different. I, I was, I was sitting next to Tom uh, about a month ago at Sharps, and I got up and did that song. And I, when I got up and did it, I announced it, and I said, "I got this. This came from a man called Blind Alfred Reed, but I didn't get it from him. I got it from Ray Cuda. I did the song, and then I said to Tom, "You, you taught him, didn't you, Ray Cuda?" And he said, "Yeah." I said, what, is he any good? And he, uh, Tom said, yeah, he was pretty good. And that was it. About two days later, I was up with some friends in Coventry and somebody played me an old record of the New Lost City Ramblers yeah. playing that song. And I thought, Cooter didn't get it from Alfred Reed either. He got it from Tom. Yeah. <laughs> so I was, yeah. Well, possibly. Well, 
<laughs> and I don't know that I taught it to him. He may have gotten it from our recording. Yeah, I'm sure he did. Yeah. I'm sure he did. Well, it would have been a lot easier to get it from your recording than to find the old 78. Yeah, yeah. Well, I'm trying to think. Uh, on the record, may, was it Mike who sang it mainly, or was, did I? I don't remember. I suspect it might have been Mike. I, I know I have sung it, but that's some time ago. <laughs> uh, that's Forty Night Blues there, Tom. What? Sporting Life. Sporting Life Blues. Yeah, I uh, I don't think I could do a very good job on that right now. Actually, the thing is, for tomorrow, uh, for, for the uh, this thing where uh, the, the Musical Traditions Club is having was it Elizabeth Laprell and name something Robert Gavalt uh, uh, the two gals from the south oh, yeah. uh, south in the US uh, and uh, Ken had asked me to m make sure to bring the guitar along oh. Listen, and he was Hoping that I would be able to do the sporting life blues, but I don't. You could rehearse it now. Tom. I don't think I can do a really good job on it. <laughs> Some uh, of those words, you know. Yeah. <laughs> did, so, Brian, did Brian McGee write that song? No, I don't think so. Well, I I might be wrong about that. It's usually credited to him, but I'm not sure. Yeah, well, I think it's his record that I got it from, but. Uh, is that your guitar there? Yeah. So I think you should get it out and play us out. Yes, sir. Yeah, I shall. Yeah. So any questions from the audience before we pack up? No? 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 Okay, then we'll... We'd like to hear you sing. <laughs> yeah. I want to see Tom sing. Yeah, I wish I'd do it here. You've been a wonderful guest, Tom. We've really enjoyed well, it. It's thank been you. Wonderful. Thank you very much. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Oh, there's this, this bloody thing again. Can I get this off? I can't swear that this is going to come out right. If, if it doesn't, I, there's something else I can play that I think will come out right. But Something you're happy with then? Yeah. Look at that tape off. Not having it would be a couple disaster. A capo
may have taken some time to cut the nails out. Oh, maybe I can pull it out. Different song, what I meant to do. Freight train. Yeah, yeah, but what I. Who's singing something? Yeah, I mean, I need to file down that. <laughs> They start out almost the same. Oh, well. Where <clears throat> again, I shifted accidentally into. Sorry. If you got time, I want to. Uh, 
stand down. Should we stop for a second? What? Should we cut for a second? Should we stop for a second? Yeah. You want to you want to sand down your nail? Yeah. Let's stop. Well, just, well, it sounds good, and then I, there's something I fumbles one little thing in. Give it one more try.
of man with her waters and the fire that all men have ever known. She came sweeping down the valley and destroyed both lands and homes. Quite as many mistakes as I was at the beginning. It sounded pretty good. I just yeah, well, roll. Now, there's something about something's changed in the way I'm holding the guitar since I mean I've, I've been doing that song lately quite a bit, but I don't know. I've never heard that song before. There's a family called the. Uh, I had the name a moment ago. <coughs> there were a family from uh, south of Washington, just sort of Virginia, maybe North Carolina, but mainly Virginia. Check it out. The name's gone. Uh, It'll it's come back the, at some point. Not the Carthus, no. What? Not the Carthus family. No, 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 no. This was, uh, uh, I think they had recorded this back in the 30s. Mm. Well, the Carthus were recording in yes. the 30s also. But, I used to have a very good memory. Do you know when the, when the actual film happened? How long ago was that? I'm not certain. It could so have been a the, number of songs written about. Yeah. yeah, it could have been in the twenties. Yeah. I don't think it was much earlier than that, but it might have been. God, not being able to remember the name of the family. I, I was thinking about them, and the name, like a half hour ago, some other name was in my mind. It comes to you suddenly. Yeah. And as long as I keep on searching for it, it hides. Yeah. It's a lot of other recording. I remember when I was in the area, you know, so sort of teaching at the University of Maryland, some people in that family were still around. They were like a brother and sister, I think. Or maybe more than just the two of them. Didn't sound like Simon. Was it? Simon. 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 Simon.
of half. You did have a half. It's true. So. <laughs> I'm just checking this. Yeah. 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 Do you want to say what it is, Tom? What? Do you want to say what it is, Tom? Say what W you're doing. Oh. The Stoneman family. That was in it, yeah. I told you. Yeah. It's the story of the mighty Mississippi from the Stoneman family. No, I screwed that up. Way out in the Mississippi Valley out among the plains so grand rose the mighty Mississippi River and destroyed the works of man. With her waters at the highest that all men have ever known, she came sweeping down the valley and destroyed both lands and homes. Now there were children in the treetops who had spent that sleepless night without any bit of shelter or even a spark of light. And there were others on the rooftops with no way to give an alarm. There were mothers knee deep in the waters with their babies in their arms.
Let us all get right with our Maker, as He doeth all things well, and be ready to meet Him in judgment when we bid this world farewell. That, that went much better than uh, what I would see. It shouldn't be better when I'm standing. But it worked out this time. Something was something about the position I was sitting in, spoiling it a little bit. All right. <laughs> Together, okay. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Hang on. Take a couple together, okay. Yeah, that's what I thought. Alright. Put a different chord. Uh I want feet in this work, can I say? 